Hello everybody, Minestorm here. Welcome back to Final Fantasy XIV Online Endwalker. In the last episode, we returned to the first to seek out Elidibus in the Crystal Tower. We met up with Lena, and um, he mentioned that uh, Reen was seemed concerned about something. And so she went to go get Reen. We were waiting for them, and you know we ended up bumping into Morin and Becklug and Fail All and you know the kids, Arkill and Ricky Tio and so forth. And and then we you know met back up with Lena and Reen. Reen's having visions about the final days, which makes some sense. And then we um. Headed into the Crystal Tower, to the Umbilicus, and located Elidibus. And uh, he let us know that um, it was Fan Daniel, in fact, that was the one who originally determined that the Celestial Currents were somehow involved with the final days. And he's the one who helped devise the countermeasure that they have ultimately used to prevent the final days or to stop the final days from occurring. So interesting tidbits there. And then um, he let us know that Elpis, the name of the flower, was also the name of a place, a testing facility where the ancient people tested their creations. And uh, we didn't know much more than that. And, but then... Uh, decided that the best thing to do would be to um, utilize the Crystal Tower's functions, at least that particular version of the Crystal Tower's functions, to send us back in time to Elpis, the time when, well, Fan Daniel, or Hermes at the time, was the chief overseer of the place. And uh, this may provide us with the information we need. And so he did. Sent us back in time 12,000 years to the Unsundered World. And uh, we were initially intangible and unable to interact with anything, but then a good old friend Zemet Selk and Hithodeus showed up. And uh, they could see us. And so um, provided some ether to reconstitute our physical form. So we are now fully formed and can physically interact with the world, which... Uh, is a slight issue, potentially. In fact, we even um, essentially invoked the butterfly effect already. Uh, by, funnily enough, killing a couple of butterflies to make our robe that we're wearing here. Well, for Hilladeus to make our robe, anyway. So, yeah. I have the, uh, the garment plate set up for the robes. Decided to dye it red just because. Just need to be different. But we do have Azem's soul after all. So, we're looking for Hermes. And, um. It also seems there might be somebody else here who's significant. We'll see where that goes. All right, so let's get to it and um, search for Hermes. Let's uh, see what Emmett Selk has to say. I was wondering what she was examining, but it seems to be the bush itself. Okay, Hithlodeus. Let's see if this observer knows Hermes' whereabouts. Okay. Yes, can I help you? I wish to speak with Chief Hermes. Do you know where we might find him? Well now, by your mask, I assume you're one of the 14. I wasn't aware there was to be a visitation. Between you and us, it's something of a surprise. Your discretion in the matter would be appreciated. I see, I see. My lips are sealed. The chief could be out conducting observations as usual. His focus of late has been aquatic creatures. So I expect you'll find him at one of the pools here. The 
fools, you say. Many thanks, and apologies for disrupting your work. I say, Hithodeus, while I've never met Hermes, you know him well, do you not? That being the case, couldn't you simply find him by his ether? Aye, that I could. And why not? As you know, Emmett Selk and I can discern the color of souls. By the same token, we can also see ether quite keenly and from great distances. With this skill, I could readily locate Hermes, but I felt that it would be a waste of an opportunity. We're here to perform an assessment, after all. By searching the ordinary way, we stand to gain insight into Elpis and the man in charge of it. This is as much for your own enjoyment like as not, but point taken. If you're going to accompany us, make yourself useful and help us look for Hermes. According to his profile, he has short, dark hair. Very well. So you know, it's because we're in Elpis that we don't wear our that we don't have our cowls up. A special exemption due to the need to be aware of dangerous creatures. Elsewhere, we do not exhibit our individuality. It is unseemly. This is all common sense, but I would not assume you possess any. It's a rare treat indeed to be able to search for someone by their appearance. And I thank you for humor uh, humoring me. Let's find our man. Alright, I happen to have a knack for finding random things in people. <laughs> I think I have located our man, Hermes, and a bewinged girl. And they have such funny faces. All right, Hermes. Can you hear me? Do not be alarmed. I mean you no harm. I wish only to hear your words, share your feelings, and know your thoughts. May we please be friends? <laughs> May we please be friends? <laughs> ah, I see you found him. And yes, hear your words, hear, feel, and think. Interesting. It's Ladeus. It's been a while. Too long, I think. Too long indeed for close collaborators. On this blessed occasion, I bring not only myself, but others who long to speak with you. You are of the Convocation. Emmet Selk at your service. Do I have the honor of addressing Hermes, Chief Overseer of Elpis? 
You do? You have traveled far for it. Given your facility's purpose, its remote location is something of a necessity. Would that I didn't have to rely upon a guide. Oh, you wound me. Have I not ever been an attentive and helpful friend? But moving along to more agreeable company, this one we chance to... Well, you certainly have her attention. Is she one of yours, Hermes? Her name is Meteon. It means shooting star. Hmm. If I may make an observation, her ether is terribly thin. I fear she might dissipate at any moment. Nor do I believe you've made a submission to the Bureau. I would remember such a concept if you had. I haven't, as you say. I judged it too early. She's a pet project of mine, still undergoing preliminary testing. But rest assured that I will attend in person ere long. Very well. Being an authority on flying life forms, I appreciate that you are exacting in your work. I shall look forward to your submission. If we have finished with the perfunctory chit-chat, I would discuss official matters. By my coming, I trust you already anticipate the subject. I have an inkling, yes. Please wait to the main building yonder. I shall join you as soon as I've returned these creatures to their homes. What's wrong, Hermes? And the Mistoma is missing. Hmm. I may have found it. A creature with the self-same ether as those there, nestled in the boughs of a tree outside the grounds. A tree? You're saying they can climb with their sorry excuses for limbs? The fashion has been to imbue aquatic creatures with the power of flight, ever since the words of Mitron created a sky-swimming fish. The Ambistomas, too, can fly, if only slightly, and they could conceivably climb a tree. Whether they can come down safely, however... Excuse me. I'll help, too! And he's off. And what? Are we supposed to do with this lot? <laughs> May I suggest we split up? If you would be so good as to assist Hermes, Emmett Selk and I shall keep an eye on these adorable creations in the meantime. Up. So, any of the improbable or outlandish creatures we've encountered can be blamed squarely on these people. Looks like here we are. Oh, there's the Ambistoma. Ethion. Hermes, are you all right? Oh. 
had a bit of a problem there. It seems Hermes and Meteon have found their quarry, a creature known in this age as an ambistoma. I believe they're otherwise known as an oxalotl? Oxalotl? Um, yet, though it has been safely extricated from the tree, Hermes appears to have found himself in quite the predicament. The ambistoma, Hermes saw it high up in the tree. He climbed up to get it, but it jumped on him and he slipped. Uh, do you need a hand? Uh, no, no, I'm fine, if a little embarrassed. Now, for your own safety, please stand back. Hermes, <laughs> are you all right? Quite all right, yes. My apologies for making you worry, Meteon. Both you and, uh, I don't think we ever told them our name. Ayami Yatsurugi, you, you are called. An intriguing name, somehow reminiscent of a new creation. Thank you for coming after me. As for you, little one, you must be more careful. You may be able to fly, but it doesn't mean you cannot fall and hurt yourself. Oh no! I've forgotten about its fellows! Don't worry, Emmett, Selk, and Hithlodeus are with them. Truly, really, what a relief. I must thank Emmett, Selk, and Hithlodeus when I return to them. But first, with the, the distractions out of the way... As Chief Overseer of Alpis, permit me to welcome you to our facility. I hope you will enjoy your time here. All right. Medium. I'm glad they're safe, Hermes and the Ambistoma. Okay. And what about the adventurous Ambistoma? The Ambistoma stares at you unflinchingly, as if regarding something novel. Regarding it in turn, you notice that it appears to be floating, if ever so slightly. Well, we mustn't keep the others waiting. Let us return to Anagnorisis. Hmm. All right. Emmett Selk. No more errant creations or distractors from matters of actual import, I trust. No. Pythodeus. It was blissfully uneventful in your absence. The little ones were on their best behavior. Being of little ones. <laughs> Perhaps it is only your imagination, but something in the creature's demeanor just speaks proud defiance for having gone on an adventure. Alright. Some creations stay outside, others stay at Ctesis, like the Ambistomas. Okay. Hermes. Well, apologies for the trouble. Owing to your kind assistance, all the Ambistomas are safe and well. I will presently send them back to their space if you go on ahead to the main building. Upon entering, you will see a table and chairs, a meeting area. We may speak there. Very well. Take care not to let the creature slip away again. All right. Hmm. 
here we are. Pethodeus. Well, Emmett Selk has been accommodating thus far. He is the one who has business with Hermes. If you wish to attend, you will have to ask his permission. Okay, then. This appears to be the place. And here is where we part ways. We will be discussing highly sensitive affairs. Only a select few may be privy to such knowledge, and that does not include someone who cannot or will not divulge their origins. What? Will I have to remove you by force? <laughs> you can try. But we've already had this particular interaction and it didn't go well for you. Um There are reasons I cannot speak freely. Let's hear them then. These reasons of yours. Who knows? If I deem your mysterious cause worthy, I may even be inclined to offer my assistance. Well, I also have reasons as to why I can't tell you what my reasons are. I do not object to her attendance. Hermes, this is highly irregular. Perhaps, but I believe she can be trusted. Meteon would not have taken to her so quickly otherwise. Moreover, the presence of a third party may help me to maintain composure. <sighs> As you wish, then. Behave yourself, do you hear? Oh. Perfectly. So, it's finally happened then. I, Van Daniel, has declared his intention to step down and named you as his preferred successor. In recognition of your knowledge and your works, the Convocation is giving the recommendation due consideration. As one who does not know you personally, I am to use my impartial eye to take your measure. And above all else, to ascertain your disposition towards the invitation. I understand that you and Van Daniel are close. He himself was once chief overseer of Elpis, after all. I should not be surprised if you knew before anyone else that he wished to relinquish his office. I did. He told me that when he fulfilled his purpose, he wished to pass the torch to me. A torch you seem none too pleased to accept. Are you so averse to serving on the convocation? No, it's not that. For a humble researcher like myself to even be considered is an honor beyond words. No. What troubles me, what I struggle to come to terms with, it's the very fact that Van Daniel is stepping down. Does this not mean that he will return to the star? Turn to the star? Of his own volition, yes. Like so many others have before him. Return to the star? Does that mean... die? Well now, that's not a word I hear often. Is that what you say here in Elpis? Mankind 
is the life of a Theris. Each of us, a drop of blood flowing through its veins, bearing sustenance. In our finite time upon it, tis our duty to make it a better place. That all who call it home, now and in future, may abide in happiness. To that end, we have dedicated ourselves to the pursuit of enlightened creation. And by our efforts did we transform this once untamed wilderness into the peaceful paradise you enjoy today. To return to the star whence we came is a privilege afforded to we who have so loved and nurtured it. A choice embraced by those who have lived their lives to the fullest in service to our world. And when they depart upon this journey, it is beautiful, always. The Fourteen are no exception. Tis believed no occasion is more felicitous than the fulfillment of one's duty. Our office becomes our lives, and to retire is to return, or so the majority of us hold. Some few have elected to eschew custom. Mayhap you feel Fan Daniel's deeds do not warrant his return. Yet you should know his accomplishments as well as any. During his time, he conceived of countless outstanding concepts. And channeling the wealth of experience he attained here in Elpis, he brought forth many new specimens. I know of all this. I do. It's just... I cannot fathom why someone so great and wise, who could still do so much good, would want to end it all. Oh no, I've made her upset. Forgive me, I know I requested your presence. Might I trouble you to take me to an outside? A change of scenery would do her good. All right, then. So, yeah, apparently, when one of these ancient people decide that they have fulfilled their life's purpose, they decide to commit suicide, essentially? Do you guys have anything you say? Don't mind us, my friend. Please tend to meet you on, right? I'm a silk. Most would jump at the chance to serve in the con convocation, and yet... On Hermes. Give me. I'll make it up to you, I promise. Okay, nothing new there. I'm sorry, Ayami. I didn't want... Didn't mean... A walk. Perhaps we can go for a walk? Sure. Is that not the door? Nope, that's not the door. That's the door. Yeah, because I believe that otherwise they basically live forever? Alright, so what's up? Hermes gets sad when he thinks about death. When others are sad, I'm sad too. That's how I am, how he made me. Don't worry, I'm fine now. So, when did you come here? You want to learn about Elpis and Hermes? Ooh, ooh. teach you. I can teach you. Okay. We could take turns. I tell you something, then you tell me something. Sure, why not? Then it's settled. Um, where to start? Ah, yes. Let's talk to Memnon. He should be near the Aetherite. I'm not good at explaining, but Memnon is, so I'll have him explain instead. Alright, Medium is now accompanying us.
was a place to uh, chat. Discuss the etherite. Oh, the etherite. Anyone can use it to teleport anywhere. Well, maybe not anywhere. Not to the ground or other aisles. And for that, you need teleporters. Oh, and permission. Okay. And here is Memnon. And what have we here? Though you look like a person, you have the horns and scales of a beast. I assume you are familiar like Meteon. Is there something you need? This is Sayame. Could you teach her about Elpis? A newly arrived familiar, is she? Very well. I should be glad to introduce our fair facility to her. As you know, it's mankind's duty to make the star a better place. A part, as part of this duty, we employ creation magics to bring forth new life. However, we cannot simply release our works into the world, for it will lead to chaos. No, any and all life forms must undergo extensive testing to determine their fitness to exist. Testing which is conducted here in Elpis. And every candidate is subjected to rigorous study in which we identify their properties, surmise what habitats might be suitable, and speculate as to the effects they may have on the environment and other species. Should it be judged a beneficial addition to the star, it will be allowed to take its place in the world. The two of you, too, were created with the hope of making the star a better place, so heed your masters well and good, do you hear? We will, Memnon, we will. Thanks for the lesson. Yes. You shall. You had a turn. Now I get a turn. Okay, then. Where did you come from? Ah, uh, yes. Uh. From a place far, far away. We'll say that. Hmm, but I probably don't know it. I don't know much about other places. But this place is important to you. I can feel it. Oh, my power. I haven't told you about it. A creation. Let's find a creation. One not being watched, then I'll explain my power. Right then. Alright. Let's find uh, creation. Hmm. Another place to chat. Discuss the Spriggans. Yeah, Spriggans. Spriggans? What are Spriggans? Those are Spriggans. Oh no, we call them Oreai. If there's many, if it's just one, we say Oreas. Though they're cute, they can be naughty. Sometimes they run off of concept crystals and Hermes has to run after them. They can be naughty. And here we have a motionless bird. Alright. Oh, this creation is perfect. But I don't remember seeing it before. Perhaps it's new? Anyway, I'll try reading its mind. That's my power. Right, go for it. Hmm. I can't read it. Or maybe there's nothing to read? Wait, please wait. I'll try again with you this time. Greetings. Can you hear me? This is my power. I can read the emotions of those around me and project my emotions to others in return. I'm not actually speaking to you in your mind. Rather, you are converting my emotions into words and intention, a process performed sub subconsciously by intelligent life forms. This ability is vital to my mission, for it allows me to interact with intelligent beings, even should they communicate via unknown languages or other nonverbal means. As a consequence, I'm clumsy at speaking. Yet though I struggle to express myself in this fashion, 
Hermes wants me to speak as much as possible, for everyone has thoughts and feelings they may wish to hide. I harbor an affection for you, one that is difficult to define. Aside from the fact that you share common traits with us, your thoughts are complex, prismatic. You draw me in and leave me wanting to know more. With respect for your privacy, I remain refrain from using my power when speaking with you. Nevertheless, I want you to know that I wish to be your friend. Did you hear me? Yes, I did. <laughs> good. Now it's my turn again. So, what are you good at? I, uh... I smash things. I blow them up. I shoot them. That sort of stuff. So I guess I'll say fighting. Oh, fighting. That must mean you're strong. Hermes is strong too, but he doesn't like to fight, even when creations fight him. Uh, I think we might be bothering it. It's staring into your soul. Uh, let's keep going. I will go and see Yuanthe next. She's usually in a small building, one on the west row. I think she would be... Yuanthe? Something. Along those lines. As I said, I'm pretty rusty. Alright. What do you have to offer? Oh well, if it isn't Meteon, I see you brought a friend today. Greetings. I'll just go with you, Anthe. I'm an apple. Could you make me an apple? The kind Hermes legs, covered in syrup. I want to share it with Ayame. Oh, Canid apple? Hermes is certainly partial to them, but you know you can't eat, Meteon. You weren't made to do so. But I like it too. It may seem that way, but it's due to your ability to share others' feelings. You've taken Hermes' likes for your own. In any case, I can't prepare an apple right now. I'll bring one for Hermes soon, I promise. I'm sorry, Yami. I wanted to show you my favorite thing, but then I could ask about yours, but I failed. Eh, we'll indulge her. Oh, that's what you like. Yes, yes, I can feel it. Your joy and happiness. It makes me happy, too. Thanks for sharing it with me, Ayami. Well, we walked and talked a lot. Maybe Hermes has finished talking, too. Shall we go and see? We shall. Yes, the fact that she can interact with and communicate via emotions is interesting. Alright, you guys done? What, back already? Pity. A bit longer I might have snuck away without you. Ah, excellent timing. Twas a refreshing... Constitutional, I hope. Okay. Hermes. Uh, there you are. I can see the fresh air has done Meteon good. Yami wanted to learn about you and Elpis, so I taught her. About this place, about my power, about your favorite food. I'm not sure if that last one will be of any use. I do appreciate your keeping me to company. While you're away, I finished speaking with our guests. Finished? Hardly. You requested time to consider the invitation, so we have no choice but to occupy ourselves with an inspection of your work. My apologies. 
It has been decided that Emmett Silk and Hikladeus will accompany me as I attend to my duties. If you wish to learn more, perhaps you would like to come too. I'm compelled to remind you that she is in no way associated with the Convocation. We simply chance to meet at Propylion. There is no guarantee that the matters we discuss will remain private. I do not mind. To see the joy her presence brings Meteon, I cannot imagine our mysterious friend harbors malicious intent. Not yet. Uh, Ayame is kind. Truly, truly, she taught me as much as I taught her. You're coming, of course, to watch Hermes. You're bound to learn lots and lots. Sure. There's something here, either about this place or about Hermes, that we need to know. Meteon? This time we all get to go for a walk. Isn't it exciting? Damn it. It's held that all civil organizations should conduct their affairs with total transparency, and the Convocation is no exception. That doesn't mean we are obligated to show our work to unknown entities, such as you. Consider yourself privileged and behave accordingly. Alright. And Hippolytus. Though I see new creations on a daily basis, here they look at them with a different eye. It will be interesting to observe Hermes at work. Alright. What's first? If everyone is ready, there are a few creations I need to check on. First, we shall return to the spot where we found our wayward Ambistoma. Have care when you step outside a hub, for there may be more unruly creatures about. I'm more than capable of dealing with unruly creatures. have to say here. Meteon. So beautiful. Petaluda. I hope they make it into the world. I do believe they do. We bumped into them once or twice. Come Silk. All of them in vigor now. Hmm. When we were discussing his nomination, he was melancholy incarnate. And Glodeus. Oh, yes. The Yenthine Petaluda. One of the newest species of the ever-popular butterfly. Hmm. You're still bothered about your robe. Don't be. The few specimens we repurposed won't be missed. That you think. Who knows what unintended consequences any change we effect here might have. And this here is a new species of Petaluda we recently set loose. They've been doing very well, managing to maintain a stable existence thus far. If it can see its observation period to an end without issue, we shall release it into the world. Tell me, you know the difference between living beings and arcane entities? Not exactly. It is the presence of a soul. Yet the soul isn't something you can choose to have at will. But it manifests only in those beings who f whose forms adhere to the laws of creation that can endure on their own. Beings who do not fulfill this requirement, such as those spontaneously born of magic, or natural phenomena do not have souls. No matter how much it might resemble flora or fauna, if it lacks a soul, then it is considered an arcane entity. So you see, it's not for mankind to decide what is living. That domain lies beyond our manipulation, and it is hubris to assume otherwise. But come, let us head to the nearby beacon. I have received a report that arcane entities have gathered there. Okay. Interesting.
Okay. Let's take some lightning sprites. Meteon? Interesting. You're interesting too. Tell me, how did you find the Ambistoma? Mitselk? We're meant to be observing Hermes, but instead we're stuck with Meteon. Well, I suppose she herself serves as proof of his prowess as a researcher and a creator, both. And Hithlodeus? A fascinating creation, much like yourself, little one. Uh, renowned as Hermes is for his blind life forms, it's a rare privilege to be able to see one of his works in progress. Alright then, Hermes. Oh yes, Lightning Numa. This is the report said. Although we call this structure a beacon due to its form, it is in fact a magical device. By manipulating the balance of elements, it keeps the isle airborne and maintains the climate thereupon. In the course of its operation, it often sees an internal shift towards a given element. Right now, that element is lightning, which draws the Numa here to replenish their ether. Hmm, it appears Meteon is busy. Now, would you care to assist me in her stead and feed the Numa? By using this lightning converger, you can harness ambient lightning and focus it into a ball. A veritable feast for our dazzling friends. Come on, give it a try. All right, then. Oh, it's a ground targeted. All right, there's one. And there's two. Perfectly done, Ayami. Look. See how they gather to feed? How they express themselves through their actions despite their lack of words? Speech is not the sole defining characteristic of a thinking, feeling creature, nor is silence indication that they do not possess these qualities. Be it a soulless arcane entity such as the Numa, or an ephemeral life form such as the Petaluda, all seek to perpetuate their existence, to survive. Is Meteon an arcane entity? A good question. I can answer it from a theoretical standpoint, but ultimately, it ultimately falls to the Bureau of the Architect to pass judgment. Those with exceptional vision, such as Hithodeus, may be able to ascertain her true nature. But to me, it doesn't matter. She is herself, and that is all I need to know. Oh, you finished already? I'm sorry, I, I was in the way. Don't worry, my dear. They missed, uh, they missed nothing of note, and we still have plenty of work for them to observe. Next, we'll head east to the Morning Dew. I need to speak with some observers there. All right. Let's go find Hermes and, uh... See what he's up to next. Oh. A goo boo. Um, Hithlodeus. Oh, this fellow's been the talk of the Bureau. The, com the combination of a carefree aspect and endless rows of fangs is strangely charming. Emmett Selk. Was there a guiding theme or any method to the madness that is this random assortment of features? And Meteon. It's adorable, but where it sneezed, Hermes went flying once. 
Yes, they, they, they do have a powerful sneeze. All right, Hermes. Amazing, is it not? The Ampelos, one of our newest subjects. Ampelos? Okay. So, how are we coming along? Hmm. Help is flowers. It makes sense that they were here. They are a product of Elpis, and so named for their birthplace. A happy accident, born of the hands of a former researcher who loved beautiful blossoms. Unique for how they change color, to reflect the emotional state of those nearby. Though be it here or elsewhere, they are seldom seen in any hue save purest white. Reflect the emotional state, you say? By what means do they achieve this? In creation, there exists an energy wholly apart from ether, one driven by emotions. In like manner to how we manipulate ether, this flower is subject to the influence of said energy. While it has no will of its own, it is sensitive to the prevailing emotion in the vicinity and reacts by altering its color and vibrancy. Yes. Akasha? Akasha? It is one of the unseen energies defined by Hanish alchemical theory. Though a gross oversimplification, some describe it as an essence influenced by feeling. So this seems to confirm Nadana's theory. About the flower, at least. Akasha? Though I'm not familiar with the term, your description suggests it is the self-same energy. Dynamis, we call it. And those entities like the Elpis flower, that have the ability to interact with this energy, converting emotions into tangible phenomena, are Antelekis. That you are, my dear. And no ordinary one at that. But the first, possessed of free will. Wait. A form of energy other than ether? Dynamis? I've never heard of such a thing. Hardly surprising. Dynamis cannot be seen, much less felt. And though its existence has long been theorized, we had no proof until the flower's serendipitous creation. What's more, Dynamis is far weaker than ether. Under normal circumstances, its effects are drowned out by the latter. On account of which, beings comprised of and reliant upon the ether, like you and I, are unable to make practical use of Dynamis. Tis a truly esoteric thing, known to but a select few scholars. Intriguing. Then, given the limitations you described, why create Neteon? Our star, Aetheris, is especially rich in ether, so much so that its name is derived from it. However, 
when we consider all energy in existence here and in the vast space beyond, Dynamis may account for as much as 68.3%. Very specific number. The more abundant form by far. Were we able to control it, we could open the door to limitless possibilities. Tis not unlike a gently flowing stream, unable to break through the dam of ether barring its path. But if we could imbue the stream with the vigor of a raging river... Ah, not that I have such grand ambitions. Nay, I merely wish to create a being that could traverse the great expanse. The relative scarcity of ether beyond the bounds of this star was a concern. And so, I looked to another source of energy by necessity. That being Dynamis. No wonder her ether is so thin. Precisely. Yours is thin too. Like an entelechy. Like me. So... Are we the same? Entelechies. Hmm. There's potentially some clues there. The idea of this dynamis becoming a raging river and breaking through the dam of ether shrouding the star. That sounds an awful lot like about what's happening. And the fact that our ether is thin, which allows us to interact with dynamis, would allow it to also interact with us, affecting transformations, potentially. If I'm thin, it's because Emmett Sunk didn't do a proper job. Well, I have been known to transcend my limits with nothing but determination. We'll go with that one. That sounds more akin to the desperate flailings of a wild beast when facing imminent death. Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe you'll, uh, see it one day. A deficit of ether alone does not an Entelechi make. It would, however, make it easier for you to interact with Dynamis. And limited though its influence may be, this quality could prove the difference between victory and defeat. You'd do well not to underestimate it. You know, it could potentially, you know, let me break my limits? Hmm? Oh dear. I'd forgotten about the poor fellow. You must excuse me a moment while I go and verify a few more things. All right. What has Hitlodeus had to say? Never before had I heard of Dynamis or Entelechies. I can only assume the Alpus flower was submitted to the Bureau before I joined. And Meteon? Entelechy or no, we're friends in thinness. And Hermes? All appears to be well. This shouldn't take long. Okay. What does Emmett Selk have to say? Not that I or anyone else would be able to make use of it, even if we knew. But it irks me to discover there is an entirely different form of energy, and no one told me. That personal annoyance beside, Hermes' knowledge is undeniably impressive. Given that there are none among the 14 who specialize in the Celestial, we would be, he would be a welcome addition. Assuming he can be persuaded to join, that is. I still can't understand his hesitation. 
He doesn't want to see his friend die. Why did you join the convocation? Oh, oh, you wish to know why Emin Selk was chosen for the convocation? I should be glad to share the tale. Ahem. It began when... Not another word. Lest you've forgotten, we're to learn about Hermes, not me. My misspent youth is not your concern. Ooh, it definitely sounds like there's a story there. What now? I want to learn about the convocation. Sure. No, if you accompany us, I suppose you should at least know that much. The Convocation of Fourteen is a governing body that determines myriad policies. Our goal is to ensure that all is right in creation, that our star may know a brighter future. As the name suggests, the Council is comprised of fourteen offices, each of which is held by an individual chosen for their surpassing abilities. Depending on the office, one is required to either be an authority in a certain field, or possess skills that would facilitate the performance of their stipulated duties. The former category includes Mitron, specialist in aquatic life, Lawgriff, specialist in terrestrial life and husbandry. We've met both of them. Uh, Helmorit, specialist in fungal and plant light. Emeraloth. Emeraloth? Emeraloth. Specialist in medicine and healing. We haven't met either of those. Mahabrea, specialist in creation magics, who has brought forth phantom beings of the highest complexity. We've met him. As for the latter category, there is Ultima, Advocate of the Arts, Igeorm, Igeorm, Champion of Enlightenment and Rhetoric, Ashtarot, a Preserver of Discipline and Order. The only one of those we've met is Igeorm. Older. Emmet Selk, Keeper of the Ethereal Realm, or Underworld, in the vernacular. Hence, Hades. Van Daniel, Pursuer of Extant Phenomenon. And Azem, Traveler of the World and Counselor to the People. What? Well, revealing such details to you? Don't be silly. Even children know this much. And you would do well to remember it all. Tell you the tale when we're away from sensitive ears. All right. Hermes. My apologies for the wait. I have inspected the Ampelos to my satisfaction. All is well with the creature, and I dare say it won't be long ere it is released into the world. Another creation, however, reportedly isn't faring well. The Caribdis. Uh, that is what we shall tend to next. Follow me, my friends. We shall return to the main aisle and head north. Alright, and this is probably where we are going to break for today. So, we'll go ahead and stop here, and uh, we'll go see what's going on with the Carabdis. And, uh, see what's going on there. Alright. But for now, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Go ahead, like, subscribe, and comment, and I will see you next time.